Why does this town have so many bookshops? Why does the name have nothing whatsoever to do with hair pieces? And why were two women drowned at the stake here in 1685? That got dark quite quickly. Welcome to Scotland Unplugged. I'm Robert Parker and this is the story of the Wigtown Martyrs. And it's kind of personal. Cross the border from England into Scotland. Hang a sharp right and you'll find Galloway. It's kind of like Scotland in miniature. It has a little bit of everything. Hills, sea, rivers, history, mythology. And just like everywhere else, just a little bit of darkness hiding under the surface. And this is Wigtown. Nothing to do with actual wigs. The theory goes that the name has to do with the bay it sits on, Wigby, or Vicby, which is a sort of anglicised corruption of the Old Norse for water inlet. Baby. So big of you, they named it twice. Galloway translates very roughly as amongst the Stranger Gale. The Stranger Gales in question were a bit mixed up. They were probably a mix of Gaelic and Scandinavian. This place wasn't even part of Scotland until 1234 and it kind of still feels like somewhere else. It's not quite Scotland, not quite Ireland. Maybe I can't actually say that, maybe I'm not qualified. I'm slightly biased because I'm from here. I grew up in and around Wigtown and my mum's from there. My mum's whole family are from there. In fact, my mum still lives there and owns a coffee shop in the town, which I like to visit frequently. Wigtown is Scotland's national book town and has been officially that since about 1998. There are roughly 20 bookshops in the town and around the town, but the biggest one, the biggest second-hand bookshop in Scotland, in fact, is the one that's called The Bookshop. It's owned by a guy called Sean Bethel, who's had quite a few bestsellers with his diaries. But the reason this one's particularly interesting to me is because it used to be my great granddad's draper shop. Apparently, he had a spaniel that would sit in the window and would climb out at the end of the day, telling everyone it was home time. These are the county buildings, built in 1862 in French Gothic style and sitting at the heart of things. It used to be the sort of centre of administration and the home of the county court. My granddad was actually the court officer there, and part of his job meant that he had to live on the premises. I thought that was his house. But I did always wonder about the cell at the bottom of the stairs. Usually when I was going up those stairs, on the way to my bed. A few weeks ago, I did a video about Greyfriar Cemetery, and as part of that, I spoke about the killing times and the Scottish Covenant. The Stuart Kings ruled over Scotland and England. Religion was always going to be a bugbear. James VI of Scotland eventually inherited the throne of England from his cousin Elizabeth I. He was expected to be Catholic, like his mother, Mary Queen of Scots, and to restore the old religion to England. When that didn't happen, Guy Fox tried to blow up the Houses of Parliament. Scotland and England had separate churches, still do, but James wanted them as one church. One church, one country, one ruler. Where have you heard something like that before? His son and grandson, Charles I and then Charles II, saw themselves as Episcopalians. They believed in divine right, specifically the divine right of the Stuart kings to be in charge. They believed they were put there by God and therefore head of the church. The Covenanters didn't really agree and after signing their covenant in Greyfriars Church they refused to submit to the crown. They'd meet up and worship in hidden places but they were persecuted for it. It came at a cost. About 18,000 of them were killed between 1679 and 1688 period of history known in Scotland as the Killing Times. And here in Wigtown in 1685 was one of the worst atrocities of the whole sorry tale. Take a wander down to the shore along the old railway line 
and you'll find a walkway leading out into the salt marsh and the sea beyond. Unfortunately, um, this is the point where my carefully considered voiceover and uh, atmospheric music goes horribly wrong. Um, I turned up on the day and realised that they've actually taken away the old walkway in preparation for putting in a new one because the old one was uh, apparently dangerous. Luckily, 2021 me has us covered. I'd like to say I foretold the whole thing and that it was kind of second sight and it or just being sensible or something like that. But what actually happened was I turned up two years ago, realised I didn't know enough about the Wigton Martyrs to make a video about them, took some footage anyway just because it was a nice day, and then staggered off home. Ill advisedly, I decided to subsidise my two years ago self's footage with my drone which resulted in a bit of a, we'll call it a drone incident, where I sort of misjudged the position of some branches on a tree. Still, I'll just add that to my list of things I've broken and need fixed. Today. There are actually five Wigtown martyrs. The most famous would be two women, Margaret McLaughlin, who was 63, and Margaret Wilson, who was 18. There are also three men, William Johnson, John Mulroy and George Walker. Mulroy is kind of an unusual Wigtonshire name, but more on that later. The three men were hunted down by the hated Major Windrum and hung without trial. Although not much is actually known about them beyond that. The women are probably better remembered by history because of Margaret Wilson's age, but also because of what happened to them. Margaret Wilson grew up on a farm near Newton Stewart called Glenvernach. Weirdly, when I was 18, I actually helped out on that farm a few times. Her parents were Episcopalians. They'd taken the pledge they had to. They attended the services they were supposed to for fear of being reported for withdrawing. But her brothers were Covenanters. By February 1685, Scotland and England had a new king. James II of England and James VII of Scotland. There had been kind of hopes for things getting better with James actually being Catholic. He was actually the last Catholic monarch of the UK. But that didn't quite pan out. Thomas Wilson had disappeared into the hills to join a group hiding out there. His sisters, Margaret and Agnes, came here to Wigtown to visit some friends including Margaret McLaughlin, a widow supposedly in secret. The sisters wound up being imprisoned. One version is that they refused to drink to the king's health. And then they were put into the thieves' hole, where Margaret McLaughlin joined them shortly afterwards. This is the martyr's cell. When I was a kid and I stayed here, I'd pass it going up and down the stairs in wonder. Local tradition has it that it was the cell. It's not the actual cell. This one actually dates back to the 19th century when the present building was constructed. Still, when you're five years old and heading off to bed, it's a wee bit spooky. To be honest, when you're 45 years old and heading off to bed, it would probably be just as spooky. The women were indicted for having been present at the Battle of Bothwell Bridge, which seems kind of unlikely, and for having been at 40 Covenanter services, which were known as Covenanticles, that's a good word. They were required to take an oath of abjuration, swearing allegiance to the king. Refusal to take the oath essentially meant you could be executed without trial. Men were hung and shot, but women were drowned. All three refused to take the oath and were found guilty on all charges and sentenced to be tied to the palisades fixed in the sand within the flood mark of the sea and there to stand till the flood o'erflowed them. Margaret Wilson's father, Gilbert, went to Edinburgh to plead with the Privy Council of Scotland. He managed to get his younger daughter, Agnes, set free for a bond of £100 Scots. Reprieves were written out for the two Margarets and dated for the 30th of April. But the duty of execution 
fell to Robert Grierson of Lag, who was known locally as the Cruel Lag. Grierson was given the King's commission of suppressing the rebels, and he took it seriously. Eleven days after the reprieve was signed, the Cruel Lag carried out his sentence. I know what you're thinking. Where's the water? In 1685, we would have been standing in the tidal estuary of the River Bladnach, on the banks of the Solway Firth. The river was diverted in the 19th century to build a new harbour. The women were tied to the stakes in the silt, and then they waited for the incoming tide. Margaret McLaughlin was placed further in, meaning that inevitably she drowned first forcing the younger Margaret to hear her choking. It was a cruel tactic, but one that was clearly designed to make her repent or give in. As the tide came in and she started to struggle, she was offered a chance to pray for the king, and she said that she wished for the salvation of all men, but the damnation of none. Witnesses said she sang songs and quoted scripture until she drowned. Over the years, there has been some controversy about whether this actually happened. It was 20 years before the events were written down in the Kirk Session records of both Penningham and Kirkenner parishes. They were backed up by elders and, and ministers who were present on the day, and the records were confirmed by the local church. It was still within living memory and Margaret McLaughlin's daughter was one of the witnesses. The controversy hangs on the fact that there was a pardon. And don't forget, this was around the time of the Jacobite Rebellion, when the Stuart Kings were trying to get back on the throne. Not everyone wanted them to be the villains of the piece. Some of the records are pretty harrowing. The Kirkinner Parish records say that Margaret McLaughlin's head was held down within the water, by one of the town officers using his halberd or throat till she died. Local legend has it that he told her to take another drink and that for the rest of his life he had an unquenchable thirst and had to drink from every stream and ditch he passed. Seems fair. A constable named Bell was said to have carried out his duties with a complete lack of feeling. When he was asked about the scene, he supposedly said, Oh, they just clept around the stobs like partons and prayed. Clept means web-footed. Partons are crabs. Stobs are the stakes. Bell's wife bore three children, all with clept fingers. And the family was referred to as the Cleppy Bells, which was believed to be the sins of the father being revisited on the children. As for the cruel lag, he was said to have been in hell before he died with his saliva burning holes where it fell and his feet boiling puddles when he stepped in them. The stories inspired books, monuments, artwork for hundreds of years. This is Wigtown's Martyr's Monument at the top of the appropriately named Windy Hill. This is a painting of Margaret Wilson by the artist Mealy. And this is a monument to her in Mar Place Cemetery in Stirling. So why is it so personal to me? Well, aside from having to walk past that cell all the time when I was a kid, and living here, and working on the farm Margaret Wilson grew up on, the name Mulroy is quite an unusual one. It's one I've taken a lot of flack for over the years. My granddad was called John Mulroy Glenn Parker. He passed on those middle names and so did my dad. And so did I. Yeah, I know, that's probably some kind of child cruelty. Especially as I've spent half my own life telling people it's not pronounced Milroy, that I'm not a pimp, or Milhouse from The Simpsons. But you know, tradition. The name's only actually been recorded from sometime around the 17th century. So the guy in that grave behind me, John Milroy, it's either an uncle or a cousin a few generations removed. Fair play to him, I'd be taking the oath, with my fingers crossed behind my back. See you next time, when I'll be telling you about a guy called William Wallace 
and why his face wasn't really blue.